whether with himself, with the people, with Allah, it all, it is always translated by the actions. See, usually when you say, when you hear people saying, well, you can never judge, I'm a good person. See, true, that statement is true to an extent. You can never judge an individual fi zawaya khabaya. You can never tell by just looking at an individual that you can just categorize that individual and put them either with the good or the evil groups. But at the same time, you can go to an extent of categorizing this individual in regards to his adopting the religion of Allah as a way of his life by just looking at the individual. And that does not need a brainer. See, it's, it's no brainer in that regard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the religion of Allah ta'ala to be part of every single thing you do. And if it does not reside properly in your heart, it is not going to be translated correctly uh, on, the, on the outward. Now, <clears throat> we go back to enjoining good and forbidding evil. It is a responsibility of each and every one of us. And that requires, as we said, sincerity. It also requires knowledge. And it requires also kindness. Because the Prophet ﷺ being the Prophet of Allah, being the most beloved of the sons of Adam to Allah Ta'ala, with all of these statuses Allah Ta'ala gave him, yet Allah Ta'ala told them, Beware. Beware when it comes to dealing with the people, should you be rude and rigid and rough with the people, they will run away from, from you. And as one of the scholars says, no one that you could ever offend would listen to you. If you offend anyone by your attitude, forget it. You already shut that door between you and him. You will not, that individual will not listen to you. See, so one of the things that usually the prophets were, all of them were good at, and Allah Ta'ala made them fitriyan, predisposed, is kind personalities. All of the prophets and messengers, all of them. And that's why the, the followers, they're just drawn to the magnet of their kind personalities. You can't, you can't help it. The nature of a human being is always attracted to that which is nice and kind. Rude and rough deters people usually. That's why Allah Ta'ala gave the quality of kindness to all of the prophets and messengers. And every time they go and call people to the worship of Allah, people will flock towards them. Not just in one, two, flock numbers they will go. Why? So much so that it is very noticeable by their communities and then usually the elites will have always the same reaction why why is it that the prophets have always too many people following them is because of that simple magnet that they have to attract people and that is the kindness and that kindness is usually translated in when you come in contact with others by you always being merciful and forbearing. See, forbearing, forbearance is <clears throat> for an individual to forgive when he or she can punish, can counter uh, an, an, an attack. If you have the ability to afflict a punishment and instead you replace it by forgiving that's forbearance and then only prophets can do that and those who discipline themselves after the prophets will be able to do that simply because the natural human reaction for any aggression is a reaction of the same sort never return by kindness when it comes to the prophets, they always, naturally, they do it so easy. One of the Jews, 
Abdullah ibn Salam. He tested the Prophet وسلم, with so many things that he, as the Prophet as Allah Ta'ala said, that when it comes to the people of the book, they know the Prophet وسلم, as one of them would know his own offspring. So each and every parent knows his kids. He was not going to say, oh, I don't know, who are you? You walk in the house and I don't know who you are. You know your kids. That's the example and the analogy Allah had to draw, draw in this case. And he said that when it comes to the people of the book, they know Muhammad وسلم, because of the descriptions Allah had gave in the book, in the Torah and in, a, in the Bible, in the Injil. Described to the, to the, the smallest detail about his person Sallallahu Alaihi So Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Salam, when the Prophet Sallallahu came to Medina, he tested him about so many things, asked him so many questions. And one of those questions that, that he had for the Prophet Sallallahu were all answered. Now he has one last thing to test the Prophet Sallallahu in so that he will make sure that he is truly the Prophet Muhammad that, that, that who was described in, uh, in the Torah. And he was very rude to the Prophet extremely rude to him on purpose. And the more he's getting rude, the calmer the Prophet becomes. And more of a smile breaks out of his face, Sallallahu Alaihi And he says, you know what, you are the person who was described in the Torah. And he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Forbearance is not an easy thing because usually the human reaction is simple and we see it all around. Try it with someone, try to slap somebody, see what happens. You probably end up with a black eye in no time. See, and this is, this is, this is a human reaction. The Prophet وسلم, is never, as Aisha said, من تقم لنفسه قط. He never retaliated for himself ever. Unless if it has to do with something that has to do with the aggression against the religion of Allah, then the Prophet وسلم, becomes very angry and he wears his disciplinary attitude towards those who, who offend the religion of Allah. But when it comes to his person, forget it. Anas ibn Malik served the Prophet ﷺ for 10 years. And he says, I served the Prophet ﷺ for 10 years. Never once did he ever tell me, why didn't you do that thing you're supposed to do? Or why did you do that thing you were not supposed to do ever? Not once. On the other hand, the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he would find anybody disciplined in Anas, he will, he will say, leave him alone, leave him alone, leave Anas alone. And this is somebody, when, when you're dealing with someone on a daily basis, all the time for 10 years, and then you come around and you say, I cannot put my finger on one thing throughout the 10 years, this is impossible, literally impossible. But when it comes to the person of the Prophet ﷺ, it is all possible and it is all real. Uh, that discipline of forbearance and forgiveness was also translated in the actions of the companions. There was one of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, of course, during the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, there was a man who came to his nephew. This man's name is Uryayna ibn Husayn. And his nephew's name is Al-Hur ibn Qais. Now Al-Hur ibn Qais was a young man but was knowledgeable. And one of the things about Umar ibn Khattab is that he used to surround himself by the people of knowledge. You could be somebody of a good status, socially, economically, mashallah. 
uh, you're a professional, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, you're, but how much knowledge do you have in your religion? Not much. Take a back seat. What is your social status? Nothing. Probably a shepherd. See, a farmer, whatever it is. But how much knowledge do you have in your deen? said that Umar ibn al-Khattab used to surround himself by the people of knowledge regardless of the age and regardless of the, the social status and one of the young men that he used to put in his surroundings and always in the presence of Umar ibn al-Khattab <coughs> is Al-Hurr ibn Qais who was a young man but he was knowledgeable in the religion his uncle was Uyin ibn Hassan. Uyin ibn Hassan was a Bedouin. And one of the traits about the Bedouins, one of their characteristics, is that they are always just rough and arrogant. It's just a natural thing with them. They don't mean it. It's just the way they come out. So he came to his nephew, al hur ibn Qais, and told them, I know that you are one of the those who sit usually with Umar ibn al-Khattab. Make way for me to talk to him. He says, no problem. So he, when Uyayn ibn Hassan comes to Umar ibn al-Khattab and he says, he ibn al-Khattab, there you are ibn al-Khattab in a very kind of condescending and mocking way. Look at you, Umar ibn al-Khattab. Verily, you're no fair. You're not a fair individual, nor are you generous when it comes to giving the people their right dues. And you're talking to Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn al-Khattab, in a narration, he says that he got so angry, looked like a raha. He became very, like a, a, a boiling pot, if you will. Then al hurr ibn Qais, the knowledgeable young man, looked at Umar ibn Khattab and saw the anger. And he says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, Allah Ta'ala says, Khudi al Afwa, wa Umar bil Urfi, wa A'rid ani al Jahirin. Allah Ta'ala says, Always rush to forgiveness. What bil urfi, and command people to that which is known to them in the religion of Allah. Wa ahrid anil jahilin, and turn your back to the ignorant one. And by Allah, this one, and he's pointing to his uncle, is one of those ignorant ones. So forgive him. He said immediately, Umar ibn Khattab 
cooled off right off the bat. وَكَانَ وَقَّافًا عِنْدَ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ Umar ibn al-Khattab could be in, in his wrong path about anything. The minute he will hear a guidance from the Qur'an, he will stop right away. And we don't have to go too far. When the Prophet ﷺ died, it was a shock for anybody. Literally, everyone was literally shocked out of their shells, all the companions. And it is not something easy, Ikhwan. We can easily, we all hear about how the Prophet ﷺ died and how shocked the Sahaba were. But it, it, it is nothing, and, and I'm sure that the majority of us experience death of dear ones and, and beloved ones to us. But it would never come close, close to the death of the Prophet and, and that shock that caused within Medina and with the, with the companions of the Prophet Anas ibn Malik described him coming into Medina, he says, literally, and this is no metaphor, literally he says that when the Prophet came to Medina, every single thing in Medina lit, literally everything, the walls, the trees, we're looking at a palm tree, and it's lit. It's no Christmas light, but it is lit. Literally lit from the nur, the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala putting every single thing in Medina because of the barakah of the Prophet ﷺ being in that place. When he died, he says everything went dark. Literally, switch on, switch off. And everything went dark. And it wasn't a metaphor either. It's true. Everything went dark. He said, the companions, each one of them, reacted in his own way. Umar ibn al-Khattab pulled his sword and he says, if I hear anybody seeing the Prophet ﷺ died, I'll chop his head off. No, he did not die, but rather Allah raised him like he raised Isa ibn Maryam. And he's coming back. And then Abu Bakr al-Siddiq goes in and saw with his own eye that the Prophet ﷺ is dead in the room of his daughter Aisha anha comes out and the first person that he addresses was Umar and he's tell, he told them take a seat, sit down Umar, sit down he says Man kana Allah, that whoever worship Allah, those who worship Allah Allah Ta'ala is ever living and in those who worship Muhammad <clears throat> then Muhammad is dead and then Umar is still in a shock but Abu Bakr Siddiq continues to say وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ Muhammad is no one is nothing but a prophet is none but a prophet قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ so many prophets came before him should he die in qalabtum ala a'qabikum you will turn away from the religion of Allah you will go crazy Umar ibn al-Khattab says by Allah I know that verse but by Allah it was when, when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq recited it it was as if it were the very first time for me to hear that very verse as if it was the first time revealed I've never heard it before. But this is what, and he says that woke me up. And it was, it was a reality that all of the companions uh, dealt with. In short, when it comes to uh, enjoining good and forbidding evil, it requires sincerity. It requires knowledge because you could very well be calling to that which is wrong and to you it is a good thing but the good intention never makes a wrong thing right well, I, I, didn't, I meant well meaning well is one thing doing wrong is another thing you have to mean well and do well and you can't mean well and do well unless if you sincerely do it for Allah's sake and two follow the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ based on knowledge and also having the kindness while you're doing it because you are representing the Prophet 
You can't speak or behave on behalf of Islam and the religion of Allah and on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ and you are nothing in your behavior like the Prophet ﷺ. And you are in no way representing Al-Islam, the kindness of Al-Islam, peace of Al-Islam. And you say peace, peace, peace. But when it comes to your actions, they're nothing relating to peace. So you have to have the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ in every single thing you do. Because you are presenting the religion of Allah, whether you want it or not. And you are speaking on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ, whether you want it or not. So you better watch how you do it, and when you do it, and based on what knowledge you're doing it. And then also, you have to have patience. And I close with this one, because this is the fourth requirement that we have to always adopt. <clears throat> Sincerity, knowledge, kindness, and also patience. Patience when it comes to the results. So many of us want things to become better yesterday. Not, not next minute or hour or day or week. That we want it to happen yesterday. It's not, it's not your worry. It is not your job to worry about whether people are going to be guided or not. But what is required from you is to do your job in relaying the message of Al Islam. In do your job and leave the job of Allah to Allah. Because when it comes to guidance, it is of two types. And this is where we go, we go with our own ignorance in this regard. We go the wrong path. We think that we are responsible for people to be guided. No, you're not. See, you're not responsible for people to be guided, but what you're responsible for is for you to relay the message. And that's, that's all you can do. Your job is done. The minute you relay the message, then you're done. Even the Prophet ﷺ could not help his own uncle Abu Talib. See, because the guidance is of two sorts. The guidance of conveying the message, that's your job and mine. All, each and every follower of the Prophet ﷺ is responsible to convey the message of Islam in his statement, behavior, everything. That is the guidance of conveying the message. Now, the guidance of the heart, you don't have a hand in it. You don't have a hand in people following the guidance or not. That is why in, after you relay the message, you have to be patient. You don't need to wait for the result to happen yesterday. And this starts with your own household. Do the best you can in regards to conveying the message. First of all, adopt the ways of Muhammad Sallallahu and Islam in yourself. And teach it to your family, teach it to your wife, kids, relatives, the, the, your community. But mainly, make sure that you follow that, couple that with the dua to Allah. To make your work coupled with the work of Allah. Meaning, you want the guidance of conveying the message to have a fruit? Then ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it have the fruit by opening the hearts as the Prophet sallallahu says that when it comes to the hearts that when it comes to the hearts in regards to the hearts accepting the guidance it is between two fingers of Allah the most merciful and Allah can twist it and turn it around one day it can be on guidance and next day it will flip or the other way around that is why the Prophet ﷺ taught you and I not to take it for granted that, oh, mashaAllah, I'm Muslim on the right path and go ahead and praise yourself what you want. As they say, self praise suck. See, when you self praise yourself, that's no way to go. It's no good. But what the praise you're looking for is the praise of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ taught you and I not to take it for granted. By always in sujood, say, Ya, muq ya muqallib al qulubi, thabbit qalbi ala deenik, ala ta'atik. Oh, the one who turns and twists the hearts around, make my heart steadfast on your religion, on your guidance. Because you're never sure. You could very well be to the very last minute, shaitan comes to you and take that heart away from La ilaha illallah and you're in trouble.
as, and I close with this one, Al-Imam Ahmed as he was dying, and Al-Imam Ahmed being the Imam in taqwa, in righteousness, in steadfastness, and all of it, example. He says that when he was in his bed of death, his son was next to him and say, Oh Father, say la ilaha illallah. Say la, reminding him to say la ilaha illallah. And Imam Ahmed says, Laysa ba'd. Not yet, not yet. And then he would pass, kind of go and conscious for a few minutes. And during that period, he will keep saying, not yet, not yet. When he comes back again, his, his son would ask him, what were you saying, Father? I'm telling you to say that. I don't let you tell me not yet. He says, I wasn't talking to you. He says, a shaitan came to me and he was telling me, oh, you skipped. Oh, you, you slipped away, Ahmed. That means you did not fall in my traps, Ahmed. And he says, not yet. Not yet to a shaitan because a shaitan can easily play the trick. Oh, mashallah, you slipped. Uh, you're okay. You're, you're, you're about done. You're not done until you meet Allah. That's when you're done. For as long as you are in this life, in this world, breathing, a shaitan is your imminent enemy that wants nothing but to throw you in hellfire. For a surety. For a surety. Which means that you always have to keep your guards until you meet with Allah Ta'ala. Never, never take it for granted that, oh, mashallah, I am on the right track. I am the most righteous individual, and I am, and I am, and I am. No, 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 no. The most beloved, the most righteous, the most of the sons of Adam who worshipped Allah Ta'ala the most is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in every way. Yet, yeah, he used to always say, Ya muqallib al qulubi thabbit qalbi, be, me, my own heart. Make my heart steadfast on, on the religion, on at taqwa, on righteousness. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us on that track, make us steadfast on at taqwa, and make us examples for ourselves and for others. Jazakum Allah khair for having me in your communities. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum.